really wild animals out there. Have you ever wondered? Where is this seal going? Whoa! What happens when you uh, leave it to beaver? How do you get to Swan Lake? What kind of a beast is a wildebeest? Is it really possible to make a home out of spit? And why is it so hard to get a contract that these days you won't charge an arm and a leg? The answers are all ahead. So let's start building. It's National Geographic's Really Wild Animals. <laughs> gang, construction form and spin here. Today we're going to look at animal builders and build something ourselves, something incredible. Look out! I've got to tell you, building is not easy. You have to have the right tools, the right materials, and the paperwork can drive you nutty. But the amazing thing is that animals are doing it too. Around the world, animals are constructing tunnels and towers, burrows and bowers, all sorts of amazing homes. They do it to avoid enemies, to escape bad weather, and to raise their young. How do they build? What do they build? Let's take a look. We interrupt this program to bring you a special announcement. We have just discovered structures so strange, so bizarre, we now feel certain that they are the work of aliens from another planet. Wait a minute. There is a building so complex, we feel sure it is the creation of Martians. Insects made that? They're beings with three heads and five degrees in advanced architecture. Look at the pictures, those are termites. To make this, they needed hands so tiny and brains so... Stop! Here's the real story. Welcome to Termite Towers, one of the most amazing construction projects on Earth. These mounds can be more than 20 feet high, and they're all built by these tiny insects, termites. In human terms, that would be nearly 10 times bigger than the biggest skyscraper on Earth. A metropolis of mud. Just like lots of homes, a termite tower comes complete with its own kind of air conditioning. When it's roasting outside, the airflow through these towers keeps the termites cool and comfy. Here's the most important room, the home of the Queen Termite. Ugh, she's swollen and gushy and hundreds of times bigger than the others. What she really is, is an egg factory. She can turn out 30,000 eggs a day. Imagine if your mom turned out 30,000 kids a day. Termites have one of the most complex societies on Earth. They live together, they work together, they crawl together, they build together. You get the idea. Workers put pieces of soil on the wall and glue them into place with saliva. In less than 24 hours, it will set as hard as brick. And it needs to be, for this tower is a fortress, shelter from storms and enemies. Oh, what's that? A tongue? The tongue of an aardvark looking for a tasty snack. Hundreds of workers rush to repair the walls. And little by little, the termite tower rises once again. I've got to say, those termites get the job done, don't they?
inspected. Make sure that we're protected. Design it, refine it, won't stop till it's done. what we're building over here. Hey! Watch what you're doing! You know, most animals build for themselves, but some bodacious builders do a lot more. Check it out. Today on Mary's Stewart's Home Show, we're going to travel to North America, to the Rocky Mountains. Oh, 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 there we go. Oh, to show you how you can make this beautiful pot. Isn't it fabulous? But this exquisite setting didn't start out this way. Oh, no. It's the work of my friend right here, the beaver. He doesn't just build a home. He remakes the entire landscape. Well, here's how this area started out. You would have been embarrassed to invite your friends over, huh? It needed a total makeover. That's when the beaver's gone to work. <clears throat> just look at this guy. He can chew through a tree as big as a telephone pole. He drags the branches across the water and blocks the stream right off. When it's done, he's built a dam and turned the stream into a pond. Look at this darling setup. <clears throat> Behind the dam, they've also got a home for shelter. They call it a lodge. Don't confuse that with the Lodge of Elks. The branches not used in the building can also be chewed on as food. Now, here's a good thing. When the beaver builds, he doesn't just construct a home for himself and his family. Oh, no. He creates an entire habitat, a place for lots of animals to live and grow. Everything from ducks and deer to wrens and owls all come to this new pond to dwell. The beaver started out making one home and he created a whole neighborhood. And that's a really good thing. So until next time, this is Mary Stewart saying so long. Keep that house beautiful. Louis Smith here from Animal Abodes, real estate agent to the stars. You got two legs, you got eight legs. We got the place for you. Now, there's just three words I want you to remember. Location, location, location. Let's say you're too lazy to build. No problem, don't build, rent. That's right, just move right into someone else's home. It's a steal, lots of animals do it. Trust me, you'll love it. Now, picture yourself in this beautiful pre-owned home. Once it was a conscious shell, now it's perfect for that hermit crab on the go. Or, for the truly discriminating rattlesnake, we have a prairie dog town. They've carved out the tunnels. You can move right in. Finally, if you don't mind sharing with a human or two, we've got some very nice sublets, perfect for hibernation, e even for that hard-to-please black bear. The cubs will love it, too. So when building is more than you can bear, try Animal Rentals. We'll be there. Trust me, you'll love it. A symphony in silk. The exquisite architecture of nature. A web glistening in the sunlight. There's only one problem. Beggar's traps! <sighs> Houses of doom! When spiders build, they're not just building homes to live in, these are funeral homes! Ah! When an unsuspecting insect wanders into the web and rings the doorbell, guess who's coming to dinner? Of all the animals that build, the spider is one of the very few that makes a trap to catch its food. Even before the dinosaurs, spiders were building silk webs to snare their prey. Today there are more than 35,000 different kinds of spiders, and nearly half of them spin webs, and each web is as different as its maker. 
Like this tarantula, all spiders have spinnerets. This is where the silk comes out of their body. Spiders can actually produce six types of silk. Some are dry, some are sticky, and most come in handy when it comes to building a web. Let's take a look. Master builders like the orb weavers start by shooting out a single strand of silk. Then they lay down a series of lines to set up a frame. Next comes a spiral of dry silk. And finally, the spider weaves sticky silk, perfect to catch its victims. Some webs are so strong they can actually catch a bird in flight. Over here in Australia is one of the most incredible webs of all. It measures almost 30 feet across. That's as big as a house. Hundreds of orb weaver spiders teamed up to build this one. And it gets added to generation after generation. See all the specks in the web? The big ones are the spiders. The small ones, that's lunch. Most experienced dingo. And now it's time for really disgusting building materials. Here's your host, Bob Vilala. Thanks, Jim. You know, anyone can build with wood or bricks, but if you're an animal, you've got your own building materials. Sure, you might use twigs or mud, but there's lots of gross stuff that comes right from your own body. And you can make things out of it. Let's take a look. Now, this old house is a nest made with spit. These swiflets use their own saliva. And here's the coolest part. In the best Chinese restaurants, they cook these nests into soup. They call it bird's nest soup, but you can think of it as spit soup. Now, these bees churn wax out of their stomachs. When they chew it up, it comes up soft and gooey. But they've got a secret formula. Mix the wax with plant juices, and they can build incredible tubes. Silkworms pull fine threads right out of their mouths. Woven together, it forms silk, the finest dresses, that lovely scarf your mom loves to wear. It's a bug wrap. Incredible. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. You want bulldozers? You need excavators? Are you looking for front loaders? Do you yearn for a dump truck? Well, you can come on down, but we don't have them. We got something much better. Hi, folks. Frank Don Frisco of Animal Builders Incorporated. And we don't need heavy equipment, because we've got the tools built right in. Think you need saws for those big trees? Forget it. We've got beavers. They do it all with just four teeth. Fantastic! You want to dig a hole? What do you need? Shovels? Shovels? Ha! Excavators? Forget those gas guzzlers! Our polar bears come equipped with claws! Look at those beauties! Just watch this guy go! Say you want to carve out a comfy spot in a pine tree. Think you need a drill, right? Wrong! I have just one word for you. Beak! Think beak! So just remember, at Animal Builders, we don't need machines. We are machines! And talk about cheap, we'll work for peanuts. Welcome back to really disgusting building materials. When it comes to natural recycling, these caterpillars are the pros. They do do just like you do, but these guys take it one step further. They're building a house out of their own... Uh, 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 poop! Bet you can't do that! The caterpillar takes its tongue into its mouth and cements it together to build its future home. It's a simple post and beam construction held together with silk threads and saliva. When the materials run out, there's an easy solution, a few nibbles of eucalyptus leaf, and here comes the next shipment! Remember, kids, these caterpillars are professionals. Don't try this at home. So that's it for this week on Really Disgusting Building Materials. Until next time, remember, if it comes out of your body and it's gross, you can probably do something with it. Out! <sighs> You're never going to get this thing done. Hey, Spin, where do you want this? Excuse me.
Yes! Oh, no! Not there! Oh, my. You know... There are all sorts of reasons that animals build things, but here's the most romantic to attract a mate. For some animals, it's the males that make the nest, and the females that pick a partner based on which nest they like best. Talk about pressure. All right, weaver birds, mating season is here, and if there's one thing you males need, it's a good-looking nest. Would this attract the female of your dreams? No! But how about this beauty? Right! Well, weaving with a beak isn't easy, but all you need to do is just follow our simple five-step process. Step one, start gathering fresh strips of grass. You'll need more than 400 for a single nest. Next, make a knot. The whole nest hangs on this one. And then it's time to build a ring. It's got to be big enough for a weaver bird, but small enough to keep out enemies. Think does anyone can do this? Oh, try again. Oh! And now, gentlemen, start your weaving. When you're done, flap your wings like crazy. Go on, flap. Then wait for the chicks to check out your nest. Hey, how's the fit? Looking good. So just remember, follow our five easy steps and you won't end up like this guy. Oh! And now I'd like you to put your hands together once more for the man who really knows where it's at, your host with an attitude, Larry Latitude. Okay, everyone, pop quiz. What's this? A hot dog with teeth? No. A wrinkly balloon with feet? No! An old lady who's having trouble getting out of her car because the door's locked? You're not even trying! It's a naked mole rat. One of the strangest looking creatures on the face of the earth. Now here's the weird part. A naked mole rat is not naked, not a mole, not even a rat. But it is one world-class builder. Naked mole rats are kind of like beavers, kind of like termites, kind of like a lot of animals we've seen before. But these guys may be the coolest builders of all. Underground architects who dig deep into the soil. Here's where they live, Eastern Africa. Three inches long, the naked mole rat was built to dig. Just look at those choppers. Most of its muscle is in its jaw. Now, check this out. The naked mole rat comes equipped with teeth outside its mouth. Cool. And lips that close behind the teeth. That's so it doesn't swallow any dirt. Boy, someone needs braces. But the weirdest thing is that these cuddly little mammals live just like insects. Only one, the queen, has all the babies. And when they build, they build together as a group. What are they building? A whole underground city, a home, the perfect place for a nearly naked, wrinkly rodent to roam. Okay, quitting time. Let's take a look. My very own high rise. Great. Ah. You know, animals are some of the best builders around. They've got the tools and the materials too. All built right in. But sometimes they need a little help. Sometimes our building gets in the way of theirs. With more and more people moving to the shoreline, birds like the osprey were in trouble. These beautiful fish hawks rule the skies. But their nesting trees have been cut down. They had no place to live, no place to raise their families. The ospreys began to disappear. That's when a local environmental group stepped in. With the help of some concerned kids, they built a special series of platforms where the birds could nest. And pretty soon, the ospreys had moved right in. Once their future looked grim, now they're back, which is good news. And the best news of all is that these birds are now doing a little construction of their own, constructing a brand new bunch of hatchlings. Because you know, in the end, building is really just about one thing. Whether you're making a nest, or a fort, or a hole in the ground, 
It's about making the perfect place to make a family. It's about a home. With you, we've seen all sorts of incredible homes. But you know, while some animals are doing construction, others aren't the stay-at-home types. They're hitting the road. Whoa, whoa, whoa! And today we're going to be travelling with some of the most amazing animals in the world. I've got my suitcase. Oops! Let's go! You know, all around us, animals are constantly on the move. Some are just wandering their home ground, but some are doing a lot more. At certain times each year, they head out on a special trip, a migration. Migration is a major road trip. Lots of animals all moving from one place to another, and back again. And now I, Professor Spin, your guru of go, your monster of motion, your top dog of travel, <laughs> will lay out. The who, what, when, where, and why of these amazing journeys. Let's start with the who. No, not that who. Who migrates? Well, all sorts of animals actually. Some are small. Some are humongous. In all, billions of animals are go, go, going. Here comes one of the world's most famous migrators right now, the wildebeest of Africa. On the plains of the Serengeti, a young wildebeest is born, and baby, she was born to run. Within five minutes, she's up and walking. Well, sort of. Which is incredible when you think it took you almost a year or more to learn the very same thing. Her scientific name is Conochetes taurinus, but you can call her Connie. In just one week, little Connie will be able to zip along almost as fast as her mom, and she's going to have to, because when the rainy season comes to an end, the water and grass here start to dry up, and when that happens. It's time for the wildebeest to hit the trail. It will be one of the largest migrations on Earth. Over one million wildebeest will cross the plains of eastern Africa, from the Serengeti in the south to the Masai Mara in the north. A trip of some 250 miles. Eight weeks of danger and discovery. Little Connie is about to begin the biggest adventure of her young life. Will she make it? Stay tuned. 
Seasons ending, I feel the change. My living situation is about to rearrange. I'm moving out, moving on. Hey, buddy, I'm gone. Yeah, got to get away from here. Do the same thing every year. Ooh. Need food and water, warmer air, shelter. Gonna use these legs, these legs. Flap, these flap these wings. I'll be hopping, crawling, jumping, running. Got to do my thing. I'm moving out. Moving out. Moving out. Baby, I'm gone. Well, can't you see I'm thrilled to maintain my way of living? Moving out. Where'd I put that? Ah! Ah! Oh! Seems like everyone's on the move. With all this traveling, there's one big question. A question that's been asked by kids like you since time began. Are we there yet? No. No. The question is, how do migrating animals know when to go? It's all about timing. For tundra swans, the timing is critical. The big white birds travel thousands of miles from North Carolina to Canada and Alaska, then back again in the fall. And they have to time it right. Arrive in the north too soon, they'll find frozen ground and nothing to eat. Get there too late and their young won't be born in time to make the return trip. So how can they be sure it's the right time to travel? Nature gives them the cues. The temperature rises, the wind shifts, and as the days get longer, the extra light actually causes a change in their bodies. It's almost like flipping a switch inside their heads. So, round about March, the flocks take off for the north. Whoa! It will take them over a month. But they arrive on time for the Arctic summer. With plenty of food around, it's the perfect time to have babies. They're called cygnets, and they'll only get a few weeks to grow up fast. Because by September, when the Arctic starts getting icy, the cygnets must fly south with the flock, or they'll be left behind. There they go, following their moms and dads. Hey, wait for me! Time for moving moments. In our last episode, Ella Elephant had just learned that her mate wanted to migrate. But Edward, I don't want to go. We must, Ella. It's time. But every year we go to Kenya, year in, year out, always the same. Well, I'm sick of it. What about Paris? What about New Jersey? Why can't we do something different for once? That's migration, dear. The same trip over and over. The one our parents took, and their parents. It's as undying as my love for you. Oh! Come on, pack your trunk, put your little tusk in mine, and dare to share my great expectations. Join us next week for the thrilling conclusion of Moving Moments. And now back to Journey of the Wildebeest. Three weeks into the trip, 
The wildebeest are still on the move, but they have over a hundred miles to go. Miles that are long and hot and hard for little Connie and her mum. As these huge herds travel, they may not realize it, but they're passing through enemy territory. They've got company. The big cats. The herd's only protection is to stick together. But this cheetah's hungry, and he's coming fast. Oh, no! Look out! Con is down! But her mum won't give up without a fight. And she gets away with only a few scratches. And the herd keeps pushing on to the north. Wow, that was a close call for Connie. There's just one question you might still have. Are we there yet? No, no. The question is, why are those wildebeest risking everything anyway? Why does any animal migrate? Some do it to find food. When seasons change and grass and water disappear, they need a new place to live and eat. Other animals migrate to find the perfect spot to have their young. Like sockeye salmon. They live in the ocean, but they're born in rivers. And once in their lives, they return to the river of their birth. Even if it's hundreds of miles away. This isn't a yearly trip. It's one single journey. The journey of a lifetime. Fighting the flow, swimming against the current all the way, the salmon surge upriver. They even leap up six-foot waterfalls. That's like you jumping over a truck. Yee-ho! Not only that, they have to get past ferocious fishermen. Grizzly bears. Watch those teeth. And as they migrate, the salmon begin to change color and shape. Check it out. At the end of the line, few of the fish will survive. But if they can just lay their eggs, their trip is a success. For here come the next generation of salmon, ready to begin the cycle of life all over again. So where are we going next? Hmm? Ah, my trusty map. Ah. When people need to find their way, they use maps. Of course, animals don't have maps, but they always seem to know where they're going even across thousands of miles. So one question naturally comes up. Are we there yet? No, no. How do they know where they're going? Imagine what it would be like to cross the country without any signs, without any roads. You'd probably be lost in a minute, but animals are born with super senses. Remember those salmon? <laughs> They don't have their mom or dad to show them the way, but they do have a great sense of smell. Their super sharp noses can actually sniff out the right direction right through the water. For them, each river smells different. They remember the smell of the place where they were born and follow that scent home. Migrating birds like these geese use another method. They're following a natural map up in the sky. At night they can actually navigate using the stars. They steer by the North Star, just like sailors. In daytime, a new guide shows up. The position of the sun. Even more amazing, animals like the geese can actually sense the Earth's magnetic field. These are invisible lines that surround the globe. See? There they are! It's my magnetic personality! Lines from pole to pole! You can't see them, your parents can't see them, but the birds can sense them. And for those birds, the lines tell which way is north, south, east and west. Deep in the ocean, where there aren't many landmarks, sharks and rays also use the same invisible magnetic force. No one knows exactly how, but they can read it like a map. And who needs maps when super senses show the way? 
spanning the globe to bring you the best in motion. All right, you couch potatoes, get up! It's time for Wild World of Sports! You wimps, think you can do this? Ha! These are the animal record holders, the masters of migration. Let's go to the videotape. Who's the world's fastest migrator? The Peregrine Falcon. He can hit speeds of 180 miles an hour. There, there, you missed it. Here, practically standing still. Could you do that? Don't make me laugh, you cupcakes. Next up, most migrations in one lifetime? The giant tortoise. Every year of her life, for 160 years, she crosses the Galapagos Islands to lay her eggs. Talk about endurance. Better than you, Flabbo. How about the long distance champion? The Arctic Tern. He migrates 18,000 miles a year from the North Pole to the South Pole and back again. Holy cow. Feeling inspired? Get up, get up. Ah, just pack it in. Until next time, remember our motto, the thrill of victory, the agony of the feet. Ouch! And now back to Journey of the Wildebeest. Under the blazing sun, little Connie is still traveling. And the hotter it gets, the faster the water disappears. Oh, I'm so thirsty. Ah, finally they see water. Water! The Grumetti River! But every drink here comes at a price. These waters hold monsters. Crocodiles! The older wildebeest know the dangers. They're careful. But not little Connie. Look out! Ah! That hurts! She fights free! So, is the trip over? <laughs> Not in the least, wildebeest. Their need to keep going is so strong, they're actually going to try to cross this river. Stop! Are you crazy? Wow! Against all odds, the herd keeps moving to the north. Oh my, was that close? You know, there are other dangers from migrating animals. Roadblocks, dead ends, and many of them are caused by people. As more and more humans spread out across the landscape, they get in the way of migration paths that have been around for years. For centuries, this cousin of the goat, the pronghorn, has followed one path across the western United States. Each winter, they make a nearly 200-mile journey from the Grand Teton Mountains in the north to the Red Desert in the south. Pronghorns were born to travel. They can race along at 60 miles an hour. That's as fast as a car. Except for the African cheetah, no creature is faster on land. But there's one thing they can't outrun. The barbed wire some farmers have put up to keep in their cattle. Fences and pronghorns don't mix. Many of the animals can't get over. They can't get through to the warmer climates down south where the food is. So when the snows come, some pronghorns get caught up in the wire. Some are so tired and hungry, they just give up. But while some people create roadblocks, others are helping animals get past them. Here in Great Britain, the toads have been having trouble. You see, their migration path to a nearby pond leads right across this busy highway. The cars zip by and lots of toads were getting uh, squished until Julia Wycherley and her neighbors got involved and did something. They went on toad patrol. Armed with buckets, flashlights, and fluorescent vests, they've been helping the little guys across the highway and sending them on their way. And now the toads of Great Britain are off the road and on the comeback trail. Thanks to Julia Wycherley and her friends, they're heading home. 
like our little wildebeest. And now, the conclusion of Journey of the Wildebeest. It's been almost two months. And now, finally, Connie and her mom and all the wildebeest are arriving in the green pastures of the Maasai Mara. There's lots to eat here, plenty to drink. And there's only one question. I said only one question. Go on, ask it. Are, are we there, there yet? yet? Yes, yes, we are. The wildebeest have come to the end of their journey. And now it's time for a little fun. Yeehaw! Our little wildebeest isn't so little anymore. She's finished her first big journey, and she's stepping out. But don't get comfy. Soon enough, the wildebeest will have to start travelling all over again. In just eight weeks, the rains will move on, and it'll be time to turn around and head back to the Serengeti, where our story began, and where the next group of youngsters will be born. And so for the wildebeest and just about all the migrators, the end of each trip is really just the beginning of the next. And the cycle of journeys, the cycle of migration, it never ends. traveling with you but there are lots more really wild animals all across this wonderful world of ours so be sure to join me on our next adventure until then this is your pal spin spin you later